Today's scripture is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 14 through 24. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. One of the things that has been true for me for this time of, of COVID is that I have just been voraciously hungry to see the hand and hear the voice of God. I've certainly seen it in the, in the hands of our medical community as they have just reached in an amazing way. I've also seen it in our business community. We are a community that's, that, that is just centered around small businesses. And so I wanted to have a conversation with Brian Batch, and, and Brian is our uh, worship leader for our Crossroads Band, but also he's been part of a, a small business startup, and I have been told that really to be the church in this day and time, no matter what size church you are, on the other side of COVID, everybody's a startup. So I've been taking some notes uh, from, uh, from Brian and what he has been experiencing. So a couple of years ago, Brian, you all started a, a new business. And so uh, that business was? Yeah, so we started a, a biscuit sandwich shop um, called Bird Bird Biscuit. The bird, bird, biscuit. You know, when Tina and I are going down toward the... Uh, uh, university campus and stuff, we get on Manor Road, and there's just this magnetism that draws us to Bird Bird Biscuit. We, we got to have our fix. Tell us what those early days were like as you started that business two years ago. Yeah, it was super exciting. Anytime you're doing something new that, that you've never done before, there's just this kind of inherent um, just excitement. And so we were, we were really well greeted at the beginning of starting the business. Uh, we, we had a a nice demand and we also experienced some difficulties and we found that one of the things that was a challenge for us was we were doing too much at the beginning and it allowed us um, it prevented us really from having focus and so that was that was one of the challenges that we, we kind of struggled with at the beginning was not having a, a focus. so right in the midst of your great success I mean you were listed as one of the top 18 uh, eateries in in the Austin area and so right in the middle of that success you decided to trim your menu which I might include trim my favorite sandwich uh, and now we, we, we still go back uh, but uh, but you chose to, to trim it down. Uh, I, I know sometimes we as a church, and then also I think in our own personal lives, we want to be everything to everybody, to be what people ask us to be. But you chose differently. Sure, you know, um, one of the things that we saw with our experience was the things that people ask you to be sometimes can prevent you from being the best thing that you can be. And so for us, trimming our menu down and, and making intentional choices really allowed us to live into one of our values, which is consistent quality above all. And it allowed us to do the simple things and the few things that we chose to do the best we could possibly do them. So, so Brian, now it's March of 
2020, enter COVID-19, and here's your business that is a year and a half old, and you're facing that. What was that like? It was an interesting experience because when you're in a position of responsibility, um, it means that you have this response that you have to choose how you're going to be able to move through that. And so for, for us, we noticed that we had to make some choices and it was either stay still and allow what was happening to happen to us or to make some movements and to really create what it was that we wanted to see happen for us. And so we huddled together as a team. We all decided that we were going to make sacrifices so that we didn't lay anybody off. And we pivoted. We made a really quick choice of how we were going to change the business model. And we moved into that intentionally. And because of that, I feel like we were able to harness the energy of change into something that was, um, that's been really beautiful for us. You know, when we visited, uh, and when we still go to visit there at Bird Bird, uh, we feel that sense of family that you all build together, and then you treat the customers uh, like their family. And so that regard for your workers, uh, I really appreciate that. Now, you have a, a new step that you guys are getting ready to do. Talk about that. Yeah, so we, we've, we kind of stumbled upon a, a business model through COVID, actually, that's, that's given us a better sense of how we want to move forward with the identity of the business and we're kind of moving into that and so we have our second location in North Austin that we're planning on opening up at the beginning of next year. So in the midst of the pandemic you're planning on an expansion. Now this new business model involves nobody's actually dining in, right? Yes. It does. So you know we, we're not going to have people in the in the, the store physically but we're going to do basically take out um, from the window service and still it a, provides an opportunity to treat people excellently just in a different capacity. So, And now you're expanding it. And we're expanding it. And we've, we've been very blessed and fortunate because some businesses, you know, have really, you know, struggled through this. So I have one question. Please. If you knew that 18 months into your new startup, you were going to face a pandemic that was going to totally destroy your present business model. Would you have said, would you still have started it? That's a, it's an interesting question because I'm faced right now with a present pandemic that has the potential to um, disrupt what I'm about to do. And we're going to open a second location. Yeah. So where'd you get that kind of daring? The quote that I, I, I will share is one that I, I heard from a monk who said it, and I think it's really beautiful, and it's, fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and no one was there. And I think the sense of moving through these times with the internal compass of just knowing that what's more important than what we go through is how we're connected as we go through it with God, that's what gives me the sense of strength. Well, Brian, my own faith is inspired by what you've been doing there and uh, there at Bird Bird Biscuit as well as in your worship leadership. So thanks for sharing with us today. Thank Appreciate you. it. Appreciate you. So not only have I been voraciously hungry for uh, to see the hand of God and, and hear God uh, through the experiences of other people. I've also experienced that same hunger uh, in what I've been listening to. And, and sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes it's from a word of Scripture, but it can be even from pop music. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was with a piece of jazz. Uh, and, and it was from Chuck Mangione. And I know how much that dates me, but I still love to hear that flugelhorn. And, and there was a piece that he wrote in the middle uh, of that album, his first album, uh, Feel So Good, that, uh, and the name of the, uh, the name of the song was The Land of Make-Believe. And here are the words to the song that he wrote. When you're feeling down and out, wondering what this world's about, I know a place that has the answer. It's a place where no one dies. It's a land where no one cries. 
and good vibrations always greet you. How I love when my thoughts run to the land of make-believe where everything is fun forever. What does that sound like to you? I invite you to hear with new ears the 21st chapter of Revelation, verses 3 to 5, and they're words we often read at memorial services. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with people, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now hear this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. What was John doing there? Was he just playing make-believe? I don't think so. In fact, I believe that these words echo the Scriptures and they they echo Jesus, who invited us not into a land of make-believe, but instead into a land of believe-making. You know, one of my deep regrets in this summer of 2020 is that we're not having the 2020 Olympics. Oh, man, I love to see that every four years. We actually had a, a... zany worship series plan that was for the 2020 Olympics. So we'll have to save it now. I loved seeing the journeys that each of the athletes took to be where they were. I, I love uh, seeing the exploits of, of their abilities. I also love the pre-race, uh, pre-swim, pre-game, pre-fight rituals that they do where they visualize themselves actually doing what they had trained for. None of them gets to the podium or even gets to the Olympic trials without a lot of believe-making. And so I invite you to hear Hebrews 11.1 1, that says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Yes, I am inviting you the, this morning to the land of believe-making with God. So in today's scripture lesson, uh, Peter, James, and John ha- have just been on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and have had a phenomenal experience where Jesus has small talk with Moses and Elijah. Wouldn't you just have loved to have been there? The disciples were so overwhelmed by what they experienced there that Peter says, hey, let's make a tent here. Let's build a shrine. I mean, that's what you do with spiritually high experiences, right? You, you, you build something to remember it by and, and so that you can return there. And perhaps when you get to the next time, it won't be just Moses and Elijah. It will be some other people because we tend to want to move from spiritual high to something that is even spiritually higher. But Jesus, in response to them wanting to do that, says, no, we need to go back down the mountain. Yeah, our spiritual highs are not meant to leave us as spiritual junkies seeking the next spiritual high. The spiritual high is given to fuel us so that we can meet people that are in their spiritual and life lows. So they go down the mountain but they know they have been in the big time and they are ready to show the world what they can do. But when they get there, when they get to the base of the mountain, they discover what they can't do. And so a desperate father uh, comes to them and his son is afflicted with epilepsy and, and he's having grand mal seizures. Now, epilepsy is scary even today, but it really was scary then without hospitals and and without medical treatments. 
And so he's in the middle of these seizures, and he goes to bring his son, it's hope against hope, bring his son to Jesus, but Jesus was busy with the other crowds, and so Peter, James, and John step in, and, and they command the spirit, that's the way they saw epilepsy to be healed in that day, they command the spirit of that epilepsy condition to come out of him, and nothing happens. See the drama of that moment as, they, as, the, as the boy continues to uh, foam at the mouth and, and thrash about, and not be able to offer an intelligent word. And the thing is, it's a problem for these disciples because earlier in Mark chapter 6, Jesus gave them the authority over every disease and over evil spirits. And so they actually had had some success in the past in dealing with conditions like this. But this time it didn't work. And the teachers of the law were only too anxious to jump in and discredit those disciples and then, by reference, discredit Jesus. The disciples are embarrassed and they have some doubts of their own. What happens when you enter into this land of believe-making? At first, it means you enter the land of can't. Or maybe the land of that which doesn't work anymore. I, I was reading, uh, I was listening actually to a podcast by Henry Cloud, and, and Henry's known wor worldwide for his uh, Christian counseling, and he had actually had created a whole network of Christian counseling centers across the United States. Well, managed care came into things, and basically his business model uh, failed, and he had to find a whole new, of way, new way of life he didn't expect to. So what worked didn't work anymore. Uh, we experience some of the same things in our own lives as, as parents. Uh, we raise up those young children, and we watch them grow in their abilities, and, and we are blessed and amazed by those abilities. And, and, and we think, wow, we're, we're kind of getting this parenting thing down. And then we enter into the land of adolescence where hormones and other friendship relationships are, are, are calling the shot. And what worked before doesn't work anymore. Or, or perhaps it's being the church where we have been used to uh, singing together and, and, and playing instruments, and we have been used to uh, being in class together. We've been used to worshiping together in, in our spaces, uh, like the Family Life Center and, and, and like the sanctuary here. We have been uh, dependent on the relationships that we've had there and being able to gather in a given place. And then that's not working anymore. And it becomes profoundly uncomfortable in the land of Kant. So what do we do when, when we're in that land of Kant? Maybe we do like the, what the disciples and the teachers of the law did. We fight about it. I'm watching this in the pandemic. I mean, we blame the president. We blame Fauci. We uh, blame uh, the, uh, the Democrats. We blame the Republicans. We blame the medical community. Uh, we blame other countries. Uh, we just find our ways to, to fight about it because the truth is we have gotten something that we can't control. It's confusing us. It, it, it's frightening us. It's frustrating us. And so when we can't control something as human beings, what we like to do is just fight about it. But we don't just, it's not just our leaders that do that. That same fear and frustration are, are, are part of what is uh, happening in our own lives. And, and so what we find is those things are happening right inside our homes. And, and so my question to you as you're watching today is, how are your reactions to your own fears and frustrations affecting those that are around you, particularly uh, those you love? And the answer probably is quite a bit. So one of the things I've been doing is seeing a counselor every once in a while. And uh, one of the things that counselor has been saying to me is that I need to be more compassionate uh, toward that part of me that is fearful and frustrated. 
See, my normal strategy is in the midst of fear and frustration is that you stuff it. And you put on your big boy pants and you do what you've got to do to get through. The only problem is with the stuff it strategy is eventually it's still going to come out and it's going to come out in a way that's not pretty and affects the people you love the most. At the same time, while I'm learning to be compassionate with that part of me that's frustrated in the land of Kant, I also know that in this pandemic and in other situations of my life, I can sometimes be frozen in place where I become victim to what's going on and I figure I just have to, to wait it out and I miss the opportunities that are present in the moment. So I want to share something with you that is just uh, central to the gospel according to Will. Those who have heard me preach here for these four years have heard this before, but I'm visiting it in a new way. I remind you that God loves you just the way you are, and you can't do a thing about it. And he loves you just the way you are, including in your fears and your frustrations. He knows you better than you know yourself, and so you are loved. And there is a corollary. God loves you too much to let you stay that way. We're not stuck in the land of can't. So back to the story with Jesus and this boy and his father. So Jesus, first of all, is frustrated with the lack of faith and the argumentative style of the teachers of the law and his own disciples. But he now comes to the father and invites him to tell his story. This is a really crucial moment in the story, and it's part of yours and mine because he's invited to tell his story, how it's been affecting this child since, and this family since his childhood, so he's probably now a, a teenager, and they're just at their wit's end. And he tells his story, and Jesus invites him to connect his story with the power and presence of Christ. So here's part of the good news for you as you are, are sitting in your homes today, and that is you can take your story wherever it is in that place of I can't, in that place of fear and that frustration, and you can connect that with the power and the presence of Christ. And so then the man says, Lord, if you can, have compassion on us and deliver my son. And, and Jesus says in response, a question, if I can? You and I are living in this day where technology is the answer and the things that we have done in the past are our answer. And so we may not be the people of faith that we think we are. I, I think that's one of the things I've had to face about myself is that the pandemic has realized I've been relying on other things and putting my faith in those and not necessarily on the power of God that's right in front of me. I, I think it's real easy for the church to do the same thing. We rely on our calendars and our routines and the things that we've always done. And we are no longer relying on the Christ who gives us life in the midst of it all and is our very reason uh, for being. But do, dare we go to that place of total faith? I mean, this man has seen disappointment over and over for his son and for his family. And so his prayer is, Lord, I believe Help my unbelief. Oh, man, do we, do we relate to that father in that? And it's the prayer that God loves to answer. He meets us at the place of our unbelief. And it is there that this man moves from the land of Kant and starts to make his first steps into the land of believe-making. And so then Jesus commands that spirit to come out of that boy and everything that has identified him, everything that has identified his family is now gone and it just says that he lays there as if he's dead. The truth is his past is, is going to be 
gone. It's going to be dead. And then it says that Jesus reached down and lifted him up to new life and new possibilities. I want you to see that for yourself in the midst of where you are right now. You can never be so low that Jesus doesn't just reach to where you are and lift you up to new possibilities. What does this story really say to us? I think one of the things that it shows with the disciples and the teachers of the law both, both were to be representative of God's healing and God's presence and God's power. And instead they had made it about themselves. Uh, this is a story not about self-believing. It's about God believing. And so I, I think we are at an interesting time. I, I know for for me in my own life it's, it's a time to reinvent in my own walk with God and in, in my own life in ministry and life in, in that means that I'm having to take a new step into the land of believe making that that's true for Will and Tina Cotton I also think it's true for the church I think we're entering a really different era. Uh, COVID-19 has been challenging and strong enough that economically we're not going to be the same on the other side of it. I don't think we're going to be socially the same on the other side of it. And so the church is going to have to be a different kind of missionary presence than it has been. We have been content to be a whosoever will may come and, and come and be part of what we are doing. That's not going to work on the other side. We're going to have to meet people where they are. And the truth is it's going, we're going to meet them with the thing that makes us who we are anyhow. As a people who trust in God, a people who lear, have learned and the ups and downs of life to love each other we extend that in a whole new way and we learn how to do that from every angle that we are as a church on how we have been gifted so what's being asked here into this land of belief making well i can tell you this it is not blind faith that would be make-believe you know, one of the things that Henry Cloud uh, did with his, uh, in California, with a group of executives, the, there were some ones who had found great success early on, and they were young business people in their 30s. They actually had become multimillionaires. And then with COVID-19, they were losing those businesses all over the place. And many of them just lost their reason to live. Some of them were talking about ending their very lives. And so Henry brings together those and some people who have some years on them. And the people who have their years on them talking about the days of the fuel lines of the 1970s and Black Friday of 1987 and Y2K that never materialized, and the recession of 2009, and how that in the middle of all those things there were sacred moments, and then there was even greater life on the other side. And so it was an encouragement to those young executives that they didn't have to give up on, the, on business, and they didn't have to give up on life because there was hope on the other side. No, this is not blind faith. You know, I, I know what it is like in my own life to be in the valley of a uh, professional failure and wondering if there's future for me and watch in the middle of that sacred moments during that time of failure and then watch God plant new seeds that I never dreamed possible following it. Yes, I, I know what it is to be a parent in the teenage years and to be out of answers about how to go ahead and yet knowing that there were so many sacred moments even in those teenage years and then there are these magnificent moments in the years that have followed uh, you know I, I, I know what it is to to face 
the scare and the experience of cancer and then three weeks later have a tornado totally wreck the, the buildings of the church I was serving and, and experience healing in cancer and experiencing the rebuilding of the church. Uh, I know what it's like to be in the land of Kant and, and then find the amazing chapter that is in the land of believe making. That's why I love the words of the third verse of amazing grace that sings, through many dangers and toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Oh, my friends, the land of Kant is not your home. It's not your land. It's not your home field. It's not your native land. Your native land is the land of believe-making in which in the midst of the impossible, God makes the possible happen. It's usually not as fast as Jesus made it happen. Usually it takes a while, but you can be sure as you connect with Christ in the middle of this, God does his most magnificent work. So in the midst of the land of Kent, I want you to see the Christ saying to you, come, follow me into the adventure that is the land of believe-making, the adventure into the greatness of life and partnership with Christ that produces a joy, that produces a hope, and that produces a kind of life that goes beyond our wildest dreams. I'm counting on that because I've seen it, and you can count on it, even though we still are yet to see what's next. And all the people said, Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we come to this moment from many places. For some, it's a place that might be relatively actually comfortable where we're doing just fine. And for some of us, this is a really confusing time where we may actually feel frozen in place. And you are inviting us into the next step of our adventure with you. Lord, we know we don't have to have a lot of faith. We just have to have faith in the right spot. In you. And so, Lord, we step in to the land of believe-making with the one who makes anything possible. In the name of Christ, amen.